Hello and welcome to the stories of Northern Life from the Sault Ste. Marie Museum. We are going to take you on a guided tour of what? A cemetery, but not just any cemetery. The only remaining cemetery associated with the village of Sault Ste. Marie before 1871, the town of Sault Ste. Marie as of 1887, and the city of Sault Ste. Marie as of 1912. It is officially recognized as a historic site since 1994 because of the historic importance that lies with the years it spans in the history of Sault Ste. Marie and with the prominence of the people resting there. Now I know it may sound a little strange and scary, but I encourage you to take out a mobile device, download this episode, and go for a walk in the Old Town Cemetery. The cemetery can be found at 1186 Queen Street East, within walking distance of St. Luke's on Brock Street, across from the Bug Lab. It's a public park, and with me in your ears, I promise it won't be so bad. It hopefully will be quite interesting. So if you're going to join me on this walk, pause it right here, download the episode, get your jacket, and make your way to 1186 Queen Street East, Queen Street Cemetery. If you visit the cemetery today, you'll notice it is in a state of disrepair. In the 1960s and the 1970s, it was still in a state of disrepair. But the Sault Ste. Marie Horticultural Society maintained the grounds as a community project. There was a restoration project along with it as well, with three main objectives. One, to restore the cemetery as a memorial to the 19th century pioneer families of the city. Two, to retain its park-like air as the peaceful place in the urban landscape. Three, to maintain it as a manner compatible with the scenic and aesthetic qualities of other parks, such as Bellevue and Penn Wood. In 1980, people recognized that the cemetery was in a state of disrepair and a report was done in 1982. In 1983, half of the tombstones were taken down due to their state. A memorial wall of sandstone for damaged headstones, not in their original locations, was constructed in 1883 as a part of this restoration project by the Historic Sites Board. As you walk through it even today, it looks a little barren, for a supposedly full cemetery. As a result, in 2002, the Municipal Heritage Community launched an electromagnetic conductivity survey that determined that there were several hundred unmarked graves and was able to identify where they were. These graves likely would have been marked with wooden crosses, which would have vanished over the years. We don't have the 2002 reports in our collection here at the museum, but we are now on the hunt to see if we can find them. We did take a look at the documents collected from the early 1980s and used the rest of the archives and resources in our library here at the Sioux Museum to share with you some interesting facts about the cemetery and the people who are resting there. So let's dig deep and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not, but let's get into it. The Queen Street Cemetery, or Old Town Cemetery as it is more commonly known as today, had also been referred to as the Protestant Cemetery, being that it was once run by the St. Luke's Pro Cathedral. Likewise, there was a Catholic cemetery and at the time was opposite Precious Bud Cathedral, or Sacre Coeur, as it was known before, which became the Boston Motors property. Of course, the bodies were moved, not just built upon. We believe they were moved to the cemetery north of town, but we would have to check the records to confirm where everyone went. The property of the Old Town Cemetery before it was a burial ground was then owned by Joseph Wilson, the customs collector at the time. We talked about him in an earlier episode just a few weeks ago. He donated the land in 1879 to the city of Sault Ste. Marie. The cemetery started with the Indian superintendent George Ironside passing in 1863 
and the old town cemetery saw its very first burial in 1867. You did hear that right. There's a discrepancy. Historic records are often not complete or exact, which is why it shows that he died in 1863, yet was not interned until 1867. We're not too sure why that is. But from 1867 to 1914, Old Town Cemetery became the resting place for many Suites. Even if you don't know a lot about Sault Ste. Marie history in the early 1900s, I'm sure you will recognize a lot of the names because of our street names here in the Sioux. This was a time in history when the early development of the town was happening. So let's start with the beginning of it all. George Ironside, the very first to be buried there. He was born in 1806 in Hamhurstburg, Ontario, not far from today's Windsor. His father was a Scottish immigrant and employee of the British Indian Department, and his mother was an indigenous woman. Being brought up in a bicultural household and likely speaking English as a second language, George started learning to be his father's successor. He worked many years as a clerk and assistant deputy superintendent. Once his father passed, George inherited the position, being highly qualified through his upbringing, language proficiency, and education. There were some complications in Western Ontario for Ironside, so he was appointed as Northern Superintendent in 1845 and moved to Sault Ste. Marie. From 1849 to 1850, Ironside became entangled in the events surrounding the 1850 Robinson Treaty. As a superintendent, Ironside was ordered to accompany the troops sent to quell Micah Bay Rebellion in 1849. After the treaty signed, Ironside became responsible for treaty annuity payments. There is considerable evidence that Ironside manipulated payments and embezzled money. His possible embezzlements and fraudulent activities may have helped impoverished people and denied communities income. His work as an Indian agent was directed towards the civilization of indigenous people, which would have enabled them to join settler society. The Indian Department, along with the Indian Act, has caused countless problems for indigenous people. And if you want to learn more about this and the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, go to NC tr.ca to learn more. After George Ironside's death, his son, Alexander McGregor Ironside, succeeded his father as Northern Superintendent. George isn't buried alone. He is with a few other Ironsides, which we believe are his siblings, Charles, Mary, and Annie Ironside. Charles was born in 1844 and died in 1898. Mary died December 24, 1990, at age 62, and Annie was born in 1810 and died in 1902. Now, Annie Ironside married another prominent figure, Weymouth Simpson, who resides just a few steps away from her resting place. They had 14 kids together. Fun fact that one of them was named Algoma, only two of the children are buried with them here in the cemetery. So of course, Weymouth Mackenzie Simpson's next. He was born in London, England in 1824. He was a Canadian fur trader and political figure. He was the first to represent Algoma in the House of Commons of Canada as a conservative member from 1867 to 1871. He was also noted at the first court session here in Sault Ste. Marie in 1860 as a magistrate. He was appointed a colonel of militia in 1872 as well. Like I mentioned before, he married Annie Ironside, but after Annie died in 1874, he married Miss Eliza Ironside. Yes, another Ironside, and it's Annie's sister. This is a great representation of just how small and tightly woven families were in Sault Ste. Marie at this time. Weymouth died on March 31st, 
1894 in Fort Monroe National Monument, Hamilton, Virginia, United States. He was brought back and buried here. Then there is David Pym, one of the first English settlers in Sault Ste. Marie, along with his wife, Margaret Pym. Much of David's early life is unknown, but he was born in Dublin, Ireland around 1827 and was known to have lived in Toronto for some time after immigrating to Canada. It was there that he met his soon-to-be wife, Margaret Campbell Bouchard. Margaret Pym was from Dundee, Scotland and was born on April 2nd, 1833. Their first action of note was when they arrived to Sault Ste. Marie was to purchase the rights of the land of the Old Stone House, which at the time was owned by Ermatinger's family. They put the property to use as a hotel and were quite good hosts apparently. But David Pym was likely most well known for being the Sioux's second officially appointed postmaster, a role he took up in 1858 till his death in 1870, when Margaret took over. Now, David's death was quite abrupt. We don't know how he died exactly, but it was rumored that Margaret, his wife, killed him. The motive? To become the first postmistress of the Sioux until 1903, when she was eventually kicked out of the role. Three years later, Margaret would have passed away herself at age 72, the oldest living person in the Sioux at the time. The couple is also buried alongside their son, Harry Pilgrim Pym. He was born on March 22nd, 1858, the third child of David and Margaret Pym. He was the first working tinsmith and plumber to open a business in Algoma and served as a member of the Municipal Council. He died on June 18th, 1903. Now don't get Harry Pilgrim mixed up with Henry Pilgrim. Henry Pilgrim was the very first clerk of the peace pro tem and on the newly instituted board of magistrates of the district court. The first court was held at the Old Stone House and John Prince was the court judge. Mr. Henry Pilgrim was also an owner of some land at the corner of Wellington and East. He donated the land for the construction of St. Andrew's United Church. He was born in 1812 and died in 1889. Next, we have Colonel John Savage. He was also a part of the District Court of Algoma as the first registrar. Colonel Savage was born in 1796 in Portsmouth, Hampshire, England, but of Irish descent. He entered the Royal Artillery in 1818 and retired in 1855. John arrived in the Sioux in 1860, and he became a lay reader, licensed to preach and conduct some religious services for a Christian congregation in the 1860s. Now, we don't know what church he preached at, but because he is buried here, we assume that he was at a Protestant church, such as St. Luke's or Central United, as those were the two that utilized this very cemetery. We also know that he was offered military governorship of the Royal Military College at Kingston, but refused due to an act of cowardice displayed during the Crimean War. We believe he spent a lot of time between Kingston and the Sioux. But his main significance here was as the registrar and deputy clerk in Crown and Justice of the Peace from 1860 to 1865. He died in October 9th, 1876 at age 79 in Sault Ste. Marie, Algoma. He is buried next to his wife, Mary Ann Savage, died the very same year as her husband at 76 years old. Now, the last specific character I'm going to dive into this evening is Captain T.A. Tower. He led the Voyagers in the Red River Expedition in 1870, commanded by Sir Garnet Wolseley. 
An interesting little tidbit, if you've heard of the Chikor incident, that was Colonel Wolseley and his ship of arms and soldiers heading west to the Red River. And Captain A. Towers may have been there. The only lock at the time was on the American side that would not let him pass through with a ship loaded for war. So all the soldiers had to camp on the north bank as the ship was unloaded and supplies portaged to the other side of the rapids. The scene is beautifully depicted in a painting by William Armstrong. Now I'm just going to list a few last names spotted in the cemetery. Maybe it'll sound familiar. Maybe you know someone in the Sioux with this last name. Or maybe you carry the same last name. It might be interesting for you to take a deeper look at your heritage and see if one of your relatives is buried at Old Town Cemetery. There are Abelsons, Bennetts, Brown, Bouchard, Cole, Crowsley, Dubois, Elliot, Faulkner, Garrett, Gibson, Henley, Irwin, Kennedy, Lambert, Manson, McAllister, McGilvery, McKay, McKennan, Miller, Moore, Parr, Rhodes, Ross, Russell, Spence, Stratton, Thompson, Wilson. Looking at the records, we can see the ages that people have passed. Most of these figures we talked about had full, complete lives. But some were just babies, only a few months old, that were buried here. Two I thought I'd mention were twin boys, Frank and Henry Stark, passing at just five days old on January 21st, 1888. But there are other stories. Even a woman named Miss Lamphere died December 8th, 1887, at the age of 104 years old. Even if there was a discrepancy and this date was off 10 or 20 years, that would be an amazing age to have reached, even in our day and age. Now, obviously, burial spots were still needed after 1914 when the plot was full. So in 1920, the municipality purchased the privately owned Greenwood Cemetery from John Dawson to be used as a municipal cemetery. Hint, hint, we just did an episode on the Dawsons a few weeks ago, so go listen to that after you're done here. But the rest of the history of our past people are now marked in stone there. I hope you learned a little something new today about Sault Ste. Marie history and the people who lived here. If you've never noticed the cemetery, I hope you take a look next time. It holds a lot of rich history, and we need to make sure that it stays present. Thank you so, so much for listening today. I want to give an extra thanks to the people who actually went out to the cemetery and wandered around. If the cemetery is a little too out of reach for you, I encourage you to stop by the Sioux Museum and learn about the people of Sault Ste. Marie and our past just by looking at our walls. <laughs> but thank you so much. I can't thank you enough for listening each and every week. And I'll talk to you again next week. Ciao for now.